Is this the end to D&D as we know it? The leaked OGL from Wizards of the Coast has caused quite a stir among the D&D community. People are unsubscribing in droves from D&D Beyond. Third party companies are in a flap, as with the limited time frame to accept the new terms or risk being sued, they're more tense than the wizard found on the front line of an army of orcs. Talks of new gaming system coming out from competitors. People are finally ditching their rule lawyers for real lawyers in the hope to make sense of it. And everyone and their mother are making YouTube videos about how outraged they are and why you should be too. In the last 48 hours, Wizards of the Coast have finally broken their silence and have backpedaled, lied and generally BS their way through several key issues brought upon by the new OG in an attempt to save face and bring balance back to the table. But has the damage already been done and is it too late? Join me and my fellow players as we chat about the possible ramifications of what all this could mean for us and for you as we sit around our table and roll for discussion. Welcome everybody. So, it's a bit of a spicy one today. We're going to be talking about the new OGL fiasco, as it is, as I like to call it, because it, it is a fiasco. There's drama on all sides of the table here, and it's going to be quite an interesting discussion. Probably a lot of things that we're going to say tonight are going to be on other channels, but we thank you for taking the time to come and listen to what we've got to say, because, well, no one else will. Hmm. Joining me tonight, we have Schnitzel. Yo, 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 just call me Pumpkin, because I'm spiced up. Ah, and we have Sarone. What is up, guys? It is I, Sarone. But so far, in terms of D&D, I'm a player-only kind of guy. And I have been working on my own campaign. But since I'm stuck in military service, I only have, like, enough for a one-shot for, for now. <laughs> we have Peter. Hi guys, Peter. I am the resident rules lawyer. Apparently I'm being abandoned for actual lawyers. Good times. But yeah, uh, always ready to learn. If you've got any weird facts, let me know. If I get anything wrong, let me know. And finally, we have Rumple. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Rumple. Um, I'm probably the newest here to D&D, but I believe my first one shot might be on this channel at some point. So be glad Pete's here. To correct me when I'm very wrong. <laughs> Thank you very much, lads. So, yeah, let's get straight into it. The new OGL. Is it so bad? Yes. Uh, have, I, have I just stunned everybody inside? <laughs> Who was just um, like, oh, what the fuck is he talking about? I was so if you were doing like a title opening and you're about to be like, is it so bad? Time to talk about it. Who's up next? Or whether it was just going to be, is it so bad? Answer me. <laughs> Tell me the secret. <laughs> well, I mean, anyone, anyone here, let's just uh, let's find out now. Is anyone here not aware of what is going on with the OGL situation? Or do they even know what OGL is? I know very little. I understand that OGL stands for something gaming license i do understand that but when it comes to all the, all the history i'm very very uneducated so i need to know what's going on i have a general idea i think maybe but it's not as as detailed as i imagine some people know about it it's a lot of what yeah, other people told me i'm with well, beat on this one i only know like the general idea of what's going on but i have not like kept up with the news okay well, uh, well, let's go through a little bit. Now, none of us here are experts. and There's probably going to be maybe a couple of things that we're going to miss. So, obviously, anyone watching now, um, feel free to drop a comment down below. Let us know if there's something that we've uh, misrepresented when we're speaking, if there's something that we've gotten slightly wrong, uh, or if we're like we're completely in the, going in the wrong direction here. You know, just you know, give us a shout. But OGL, uh, Open Gaming License. So this was a document that had been uh, created back in uh, when D&D was version 3.5, I believe. Uh, and this was allowing people to use Dungeons & Dragons as like a baseline for creating third-party content. Um, 
and the original license, I believe, was something like 900 words long. Uh, the idea is that it was going to stay like this forever. Whatever new licenses would come in, it would not revoke this license. So this allowed people to create lots of third party content, as it were. So you might see there's obviously like official Dungeons and Dragons books, but then you also see there are other books that are just, you know, they're for 5e, like role playing uh, tabletop games. And they, they, they play on the basis of what you could do in D&D, but they've expanded on it with their own ideas and stuff. And then people were able to monetize this and make, make a lot of money. Like in some cases, people were able to make like an actual like proper living of it. A few weeks back, uh, a leaked document of the new OGL license came out. They were going to give third party content creators a week's notice to sign this contract otherwise they were going to risk being sued if they continued to make content um, without signing it but by signing this they uh, effectively third party content creators were, were, were screwed they would they wouldn't have any actual rights to their own creations anymore wizards of the coast could look at anything that they made and go oh i like that we're going to take that um we're going to publish it and you're not going to get a penny for it anymore. Um, if you made uh, more than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, they would uh, they, you you'd have to pay twenty five percent of whatever it is you made over that for royalties towards Wizards of the Coast. They dropped it a little bit to twenty percent if it were uh, done through Kickstarter. Uh, anyone who might have a bit of a better grasp on this would know that even though those sounds like that sounds like quite a big number seven hundred fifty thousand, if you're a, you're a company, you know, you're starting up that it really isn't a lot of money because of the amount you're having to pay out for everything else, your, your profit is, is, is could be almost minimal in that. So you're it, especially with Kickstarter as well. You it's, it really screws with how much you're going to make. They also put it in there that at any point they could change this. You, and you couldn't do anything about it. So quite rightly, when this came out, there was a lot of third party content creators, you know, the, absolutely terrified what happened there's a lot of these people that look like potentially they were they were going to lose their livelihood the people who had built their lives you know their business their the money that they were bringing in to feed their families and stuff like that that was all going to be affected now people on youtube some of like the really big names out there you're like dnd shorts dm layer and like many others all spoke up about this you know, and there was a big movement going through. A lot of people were actually bringing in lawyers to actually try, try to analyze these documents. There's talks that, you know, what the what Wizards of the Coast doing isn't technically legal or that they can't do it the way they they think they can. Um, they think there's a lot of scare tactics and it could be, and they're saying people, you know, people are being advised that don't sign this because once you sign it, you, you're screwed. That's it. You, you're locked in. There's nothing you can do about it. And then, you know, there's a bit of confusion as well to do. And so they're trying to also get in the public to say, right, we'll cancel your your D&D Beyond subscription. Show Wizards of the Coast that you're not happy with this. Hit them where it hurts, like financially. And when the due date came for Wizards of the Coast to actually make this ha go live, nothing happened. They, they were just silent. And it's only been in the last, like, 48 hours that they've actually given a statement about this. And then they've backpedaled. By trying to make out that it was a draft version and this, it wasn't actually what was meant to be sent out, although that that that's going to be bullshit because they were actually sending these out with contracts to companies. So you don't send a draft version out of something if you're intending a company to sign it. So that, there's there's a lie that right on its own. They tried making it out that this uh, the wording wasn't right and it was only going to apply to like to the big to the big third party companies. And there's like a bunch of other bits and pieces. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking a little bit too much, so I'll, I'll hand this over uh, to the others. But effectively, this this was not good. This was a not good not good thing for anyone, and it and it was going to affect. It's going to affect D and D. Like it, this, it's for me personally, I think this is going to affect D and D uh, permanently going forward. Uh, there's one thing I don't know if you if you mentioned about the seven hundred and fifty thousand mark. Was that I believe it was about revenue rather than profit? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so it wasn't even yet yeah, wasn't even making the profit seven hundred fifty and make profit. It was just overall what what the company was making. So if if they're making seven hundred fifty k and they spend five hundred, you know, and none of that is profit, they're just losing money. Uh, so 
yeah, if they don't hit a high enough profit margin, they just lose money. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's why it was a bit of an issue, but I, I, I don't know how much it'll cost to make all this stuff, so 750k is quite a lot, but it depends on how big the company actually is and how like wide it's going and how much profit it makes from each thing. But it's also the fact that they even, I think it's even in the document they sent out, is that that can change at any yeah, time. So if you're, if you're a company will, that yeah. makes 500 and then, you know, you go, oh, well, I'm not going to be really affected. But then in two years down the line, they drop it down to them. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, fuck. And then if you're still making 200, they just keep dropping it because they can change it whenever they want on a whim. I feel like that was... no, no amount of money is safe because they can just decide. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I think that's. I think that's. I think that's where a lot of the consensus is about why this was a problem. Right. It's because there yeah. wasn't. It wasn't. Hey, these are all rules. We're locking into them. And yes, they benefit us. But we're locking into them. We're just keeping them here. It was. Hey, these benefit us now. But we've left it so that we. We've left it open so that we can change it to benefit us even more and punish you even more on a whim. And once you've signed up for it, there's nothing you can do, or we take away your rights and sue you for tons. Like. Yeah, there's that kind of issue. Yeah, it's yeah, it's. Uh, let's say, I've uh, there's been a, like a, a, what they did, what they've tried to do is in itself just a horrible thing to try and do. Now I've like, I've got no problem with a company. I've seen some people like go that they, you know, Hasbro don't care about the players. All they care about is the bottom line, and you go. I kind of don't have a problem with a company having that mentality because Hasbro in itself is a company that is there to make money, is there to pay its employees, pay its shareholders, pay everyone else. Wizards of the Coast should care about the players more than Hasbro should them themselves, but the way they've got about it is so malicious. It's 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 just cruel what they've tried to do. And the way they're responding to it now is almost equally as malicious and i think that's one thing that's also that's really really winding a lot of people up yeah uh, it's yeah it's their whole way of approaching it and then trying to make out that it was like it wasn't what they were intending to do you know like it's like with the, one of the comments i think in the uh, in their when wizards of the coast did their announcement that the response they tried to make it out like it was a win-win for everybody you know Oh, you, you guys have won because you've all spoken up, but you know, we've won as well, you know, because you know, we've heard what you've said. And we're actually, you know, we're going to make make this right. It's just like, <clears throat> just the whole thing <clears throat> just feels, this it's, it's, it's is one of those things, I guess, because feelings can get, obviously get, get flagged up quite a bit in all this. And you do have to look at, you do have to try and look at this logically. Like they are a company that are trying, they are trying to make money. And you can understand that to a certain degree, but it's the way they've gone about it. Wherever money they've lost now, thanks to all these unsubscriptions from D and D Beyond, they've lost billions in the way of trust. Like, who? I, I, don't know, I didn't. I didn't mention this already, but I, sorry, I haven't already mentioned this. There are other companies now that are bringing out new gaming systems under a new OGL, so that other people can then move away from D and D. And start using other things. I think Pathfinders tried to kick back up again with their their second edition. Cobold uh, 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 Press, I think they're called. They got a thing called Operation Black Flag. And there's like a few uh, other Paizo as well. I think it's Paizo's mate um, trying to get a community together to create. Um, I think it's called like the Open RPG something license um, that will be held by a non-profit um, external. Um, holder of the license that so literally no one can ever change it ever it yeah. will just be a free open thing and i think they're looking at i think it's linux or something like that um a look they're looking at to try and get it to hold it so it's someone outside the realms of D D has nothing to do with it but it's just the holder that has no interest in changing the license it doesn't affect them um and i think they're willing to front up the cost to get it going as well um and then yeah. actually have everything that the original ODL was there to do. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, because of their actions now, they have set things in motion that even if they backpedaled all the way and say, you know what, we're not going to make any changes. Instead, we're going to keep it as it is. They've burned so many bridges that they've mm. lost. They've lost huge swathes of people 
Now, there are going to be people that are going to just walk away from D&D because it's like, well, you've already said, you've already tried to do this. And you've only, the only reason why you backed is because you got caught out. It's because so, there's a, there were people within your company that had some integrity and actually made sure, and they, they, the people were working for D&D who generally love the game. You know, they love the community. And I think if it wasn't for those people, we wouldn't be hearing about this right now. What we would have heard is it's, it's been released and it's too late. Nothing can be done about it. You know, and so thankfully, because those people spoke up, they were, you know, actions were able to be taken. And again, even if Dean, even if Wizards of the Coast now backpedaled and, and decided to not do any of this, they like I said, it's already set things in motion now. People are, are going to be leaving. People are going to be going on for new things. The, the, I'm just trying to think of what is going to, what D&D or just role playing games, tabletop games is going to look like now going down. Like going in going into the future so i'm going to come in here and be the optimist that i am sometimes and say that i think this is sounding like the best possible thing that could have happened because it is now created new business in a way because when one company has too much power they do things like this they try to steal more than they they buy off more than they can chew right so when that happens, other businesses then slide in and say, well, we won't do that. You don't distrust us as much. And then the amount of people following one company disperses to multiple companies. And when you have one company having too much power, the best next thing to happen is have multiple companies where they, the power is dispersed. And that kind of thing probably won't happen again. And you get more ideas and more collaboration because now you've also proven that you will change the people who are in charge of the stuff on D&D's mind because if you all get together and say no, then what are they going to do? So I think it's actually, a, I think all this is actually pointing in a very good direction. I, I will be interested to see what Wizards of the Coast does next, in all honesty. Because I'll, I'll be interested because, you know, obviously I don't know how many people, you know, signed things or a cancelled subscriptions or whatever but it, i'll be super interested to see what they're willing to give in order to sort of like try and win back that trust because well, it, it's whether they it's whether they go oh cut our losses we don't want to give up too much we'll see what we can hold on to or where it's whether they make like an active sort of effort to be like no 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 trust us please trust us come back to us we're great i swear yeah. like it'll be interesting to see whether it does whether they work hard and gain back trust, or whether they kind of look, cut their losses and allow that shift away to what you, like you're saying with other companies, and maybe lose that monopoly that they've had for so long. It, it the the thing is, it's never been a monopoly with them, though. That's the thing because of the OGL. They yeah. purposely originally made it so it never could be a monopoly, and basically what they've tried to do here is force one on people. So it's not like they had one to begin with, and people are realizing it and going oh naturally know that this is not right it's they've gone actually there's so much more money in this that we're in their view letting other people have by using our products and making their own things out of it we should be getting money from that slice of cake and so it's not like a monopoly is being broken it's breaking a monopoly before it's even begun mm. i'd say the only thing that they've broken is as i said is their trust i mean there's a what great example of like uh, how much they're desperate to try to to turn this around so with the whole unsubscribing on D, D beyond did you hear that they apparently had gotten on to the site and they managed to change it so that you couldn't find the unsubscribe button easily anymore like it was a case i think if you hovered over like your account or something you'd have the option there to say unsubscribe they changed the coding or however how it is however it is it is done so you ended up having to go to like an additional website to then find the unsubscribe button. I think because of the level of uh, response that had, had come through, they were desperate to try to prevent people from doing that. They can't outright stop anyone from unsubscribing, but they were trying to make it difficult because when when you have a big thing that happens online, you have a grace, or, you sort of have a grace period before people start losing interest and they just sort of forget. And if you have someone who goes to unsubscribe and it's not easily found, they might turn around and go, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do it later. I'll, whatever it's no big deal and then like a month goes by and like, they've already they've still subscribed for another month and like they've sort of all forgot about it so i'm wondering if they were like they were trying to do something like that to try to sort of 
maybe hold people off and that's maybe that's why they were being so quiet for so long is that maybe they were hoping it would die down and they wouldn't have the kind of impact they were having and all that says to me is that this company really doesn't understand its consumers like they yeah. really yeah. did not get how important this community was to to, to people you know and I, I think it speaks volumes it, it really shows you the power of what of what people can do when they band together now He's not here for this, uh, Chad Stick. Uh, however, he did have some opinions on this one. And he has sent me an essay. Uh, mm. I would like to read through the entire thing. So, guys, bear with me. Uh, I'm just going to read what Chad Stick comes in with. And then, guys, if you want to see if you want to respond to what he said. So, this is about uh, what do wizards owe third party creators? who have been making money off their product without having to pay wizards anything. I'm not trying to defend wizards, but let's have a balanced argument. The people railing against this the most are third-party creators who have taken advantage of the generous OGL 1.0. They are riling up their fans over scenarios involving wizards taxing third-party content creators, which could happen. But they argue, what if wizards tow uh, lower the boundary from 750,000 to 500,000? or to 200,000. Well, then people who are already making 200,000 will have to pay wizards a percentage of profits above that uh, for using their product, which seems reasonable. What if they lower it to zero? Well, then wizards will be alienating a profit stream and losing it, which makes no business sense. Wizards don't want to use this on everyone, just the top X percent of people making money off their product. Critical Role reportedly makes 183,839 and 80 dollars uh based on exchange oh and then he's done an exchange rate to say it's 150,748.64 pounds on streams per month over the course of 2022 this does not include payments for projects like Fox Machina that is a yearly income of 2,206,000 pounds uh, sorry 2,206,077 pounds or 1.8 oh come on Sorry, I do apologise. He's written pounds twice. I think the first one might have been dollars. Two million two hundred six thousand dollars from streams alone, using a wizard's product slash IP they pay nothing to use. For wizards to be equally benefiting from the exposure they get from Critical Role, because that's what Critical Role are paying wizards uh, for is exposure. Critical Role would have to be responsible for the sale of eight hundred, uh, sorry, eighty one thousand four hundred eighty six. Uh, player handbooks in 2002 based on the calculation that a player handbook is priced at 36.99 and Wizards of the Coast gets said 60% of that figure 40% deducted for handling distribution and third party uh, retailer LGS cuts and costs this is an example calculation but it is demonstrative of the sheer amount of product critical role would have to shift to be given wizards equal profit to their own gains for using a product IP that they pay nothing to use no Wizards of the Coast don't have to make an equal profit by any means. But content creators are making money off an IP they pay nothing for, or have done, and are now getting upset about it. Reverse the situation. If I, as a creator, was offered a contract by Wizards for something I'd made that paid me nothing by exposure, it would be mocked, laughed, laughed at, and criticised. Still, not defending Wizards as a company, nor am I suggesting that they are not looking to take a cut of profits from content creators using their uh, product. But, if someone sta uh, started a web series, or even an RPG series, based on my books, and said they weren't going to pay me a thing for it, while they made a lot of money, that wouldn't be kosher. I guess what I'm saying here is that, it's, uh, here is, let's not leap blindly to the fence of demigorgs, go demigorgers I don't know who aren't exactly pure of intent themselves those content creators make as much content as they do because it makes them money and it is a way of making money they enjoy that's part of why I publish books I love writing but I'd love to be paid for it would those content creators release their work for free unlikely since they're saying they depend on the income so what is it somewhat bordering on hypocritical to Wizards of the Coast should do that my biggest complaint here is that people who are unlikely to be affected by the OGL 1.1 are being stirred up against Wizards of the Coast, who arguably deserve more flack for sure, not speaking to the community, etc. But again, they do, do they necessarily need to as owning the company? 
by people who have profited massively from free access to an IP and so are most likely to be directed affected, be careful which gods you follow to church and which banners to war. They have their own reasons for asking for your prayer or sword. That's uh, that's the and that's the, the end of it. So, uh, I think I actually have one response on that. Um, wizards don't want to use this on everyone; just the top X of people making money of their product. That's incorrect, I believe. I believe that it affected they, that they came out and said that in their response, but that wasn't clear in their new OGL. So this could have affected anyone. So your top X people, yes, of course, are making are making more than seven hundred and fifty thousand, but not everybody is. People who are in that sort of midsection that are like starting businesses up and stuff, they're not making they're not making that much more. So they're they're still horribly affected, and it, it doesn't just affect the third party content creators. This does affect uh, players. Now the reason why I believe it affects players, if you if people end up having to go along with this contract. And they're going to have to end up paying out this extra to wizards. What are the co couple of ramifications and possibilities that could happen? One, they have to close up because they can't afford it. Uh, or they don't want their content to be taken away. Or the other option is they increase their profit. They have to increase their profits. They increase their costs to the consumer, as in the player or the DM. So you want out, you want to go and buy that book that you really like the uh, look of. Would have cost you maybe forty dollars, what it was, but now because of this uh, OGL cost, making the third party having to pay more to cover to, to deal with the cost for Wizards of the Coast, they've now had to up that price. Now you're paying seventy dollars, and that's just like with one example for a book. But you just think of all the third party uh, content creation that's out there. If they have to increase their prices to be able to keep up with this, who's paying those prices? It's you, the player. And then if they don't do that and they decide to pull out of it, well, the reason why people go for the third party stuff a lot of the time is because arguably it's better than what D&D bring out. D&D has brought out a few decent books, I'm not going to lie, but third party books have arguably been better than the D&D books. And if you don't have those third party books to go for, well, maybe, yeah, you end up going to buy those D&D books, but you probably won't, there probably won't be as big a demand for it because you obviously you've got the very experienced people. They'll go and buy those books and then they'll give their reviews out and say, guys, this is not worth the money. And there's no third party books now to go and get comparison. So you end, so, D, so Wizards of the Coast end up losing out on this as well because now you start losing interest. No one wants to then go out and make more content out of this. Uh, you just end up in a terrible situation. I, I think I, I think the the bit I, like he, he makes a, he makes some good points, but he focuses I think and uh, rightfully so as many people do that he's focusing a lot on the financial side of it. When he says in that I can't remember exactly what he said, um, but the bit about if you know handing out contracts where you're making no money if you made you sign it it's not about i don't i think one of the reasons people are so annoyed is because the contract was already signed the original ogl was put in place to allow people to use it for free and it was said in there that it was for perpetu perpetuity i think is the word um, but basically forever they will never change it it's for everyone to use for free to create wonderful things take the money aside effectively if even if wizards just take completely move up from the trap. Wizards have stabbed people in the back by actually going, all right, actually, that was a lie. We're not doing that. And yes. now all that content that you created, guess what? Not only do you, you have to pay us for making it, but we have rights to everything you make. And if we decide that's ours now, that's worse than the money. Take the finance out of it the bit that they stabbed all the people that made it what it made D, D what it is in the back and then said everything you make is effectively ours now that's that's the horrible bit finances aside that's what they did that's cruel yeah and here's the thing had the original ogl had something in place to say that you know 
if they put it originally in there to say that you were going to pay a little bit of royalty, say like there was going to be like 5% of your earnings mm. or something, if that had been set in stone from the beginning, you wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have had such a big hoo-ha about the whole thing. I don't think anyone would have battled an eyelid. If it was set in from the start saying that, to, oh, to use D&D IP to create your own stuff, like wizards would get 10%. If that was set in from the ground up and then they went, due to the current financial situations, we're suffering, we need to up it. I'm doing that as a hypothetical because that's not what they've done. But hypothetically, if they'd done that, I don't think anyone would have cared. But mm. they, but what they've done is just malicious. I've said that before, and it, it just is. I mean, someone, one of them came out recently, like just before this all went down, didn't it? I swear I saw something, and it was like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I swear I saw something which basically was someone was saying, oh, D and D isn't being as monetized as everything else these days with their like battle passes and and things yeah. like that that people have to pay into, other than the subscription fees. And it's like, cool. And now you've just suddenly come out and gone, and now we're going to charge you for everything that you do. <laughs> it, it doesn't yeah. like, and it's very hard for them to then be like, argue, oh, we're doing this for the good of the community and the yeah. good and all that, and just. And then so, be like, yeah, that's the issue. So I think a lot of this came off of, so a little while back, and this was before I'd actually looked anything up online, but I, I, I was having a sit down with a couple of friends and one of them's very much into Magic the Gathering. And he was telling yeah. me about there was this whole big, this whole big thing had gone down. It was the 30th year anniversary. And Magic the Gathering had done a re-release. I think it's Alpha of the cards. And they were like special printed ones, like, and... They were charging something like a thousand dollars for four. Oh yeah, packs, yeah. They did. Right? They did that recently. Yeah. Yes. They ch they and charged tons. Yeah, yeah, it was ridiculous. And these are random, so you couldn't even guarantee you're going to get the cards you want. And they were only handing them out to specific, like companies or or, or retailers, wherever they weren't. You couldn't just get these in a regular store, and they weren't legal to use in tournaments. So it was just a complete slap in the face to people. And then he, so he was telling me about this, and then he said they had apparently had this. There's this big meeting. Hasbro had had this big meeting, and then they kind of sidestepped with uh, Magic the Gathering and went straight into D and D, and were like, "Yeah, we're, well, we, you know, we're not monetized. We're not, we're not monetizing enough." So I'm wondering if like the failure with Magic the Gathering, they thought, right, okay, well, we've kind of just sort of burnt our bridge with that. Let's have a look at what our next big IP is. Well, it's Dungeons and Dragons, like, so let's let's see how else can we, how can we get more money out of this one? Because I do get. I do get to a certain degree again where their their frustration can be because other people are making more money uh, objectively than they are off of off of the stuff that they they sort out but they've only got themselves to blame because they put the OGL out OGL out in the first place so it again it's it's completely understandable that third party content creators are going to be mad it's because you know there are some people that weren't even alive when this OGL got created who are now running like uh, their own businesses and stuff based off the OGL the thing had been set in stone so it's the fact that this company's tried to just completely revoke that entire thing because it's still it would have still affected whatever stuff had come out beforehand because that it is no long it would have been no longer in place so of course of course the third party content is going to be created so I mean he, he Chad it's, you know he's talking about Oh, what if it was the other way round? Well, if it was the other way round, and you put out an OGL to say yes, you can use, you can use this. Well, then you haven't you, you haven't got a leg to stand on. If mm -hmm. they didn't bring out an OGL and people were trying to make money, then it's a completely different thing. Because then, yeah, they'd be quite rightly to be sued because they weren't allowed to make content off based off of that. But they were allowed, and it's the fact now that the uh, Wizards of the Coast are trying to turn around and go. Uh, by the way, uh, that agreement we've had for twenty years. Uh, no, all of you can fuck off now and start giving us money and you we could basically take everything away from you can, can i can i ask a, a, a question uh, two questions to the group just because i think this would be interesting to see mm -hmm. first one who what was the first thing that got you into D D? like where did you first hear about it because for me it was um viva D viva la dirt league and when they started their D, &D channel that was my first kind of inkling into it so i just i'd just like to see where everyone heard from it because and then the other question that i want to ask is how many people here knew hasbro would affect the owners of D D? because i didn't and yet they're sat here now acting like well everyone loves D D, and that's our thing and it's they clearly want us to 
be the be all and end all of it when they actually when people go well they haven't been getting paid from these third party consumers i heard about it the whole game from third party creators that have then made me spend money on their products on D's official Wizard of the Coast product, like the Player's Handbook and the DM's Guide and the Monster Manual. So when they go, like, oh, they're not getting any money from third-party creators, they are just one step removed because they made money from the third-party creator through me because I heard from it from a third-party creator, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I first heard of d d was actually through uh, Jason and Pizza Man in, in our group. Um, I mean, I had been aware of D&D like I, I think I played it like once or twice with Chadstick actually and we're talking but we're talking like nearly 10 years ago so I really didn't know anything about it so I, I didn't think much of it I couldn't tell the difference between what was D&D and what was third party so I, I don't really count it for me it was more when Jason had uh, introduced it to me and even then i still didn't know what was third party and what wasn't but we were playing we played homebrew right off the bat so again i had no idea what was supposed to be what and mm. then the the actual the first thing outside of that outside of actually playing with a group was vox machina on amazon and i heard that it was based off of D D, and i watched that and i was like oh I recognize some of these voices like well, who's this and i looked it up it's like from the people who have done uh, critical role and i was like what's critical role and then i started looking at that so for me it was third party so i pers i uh da, 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 what words i my fr i had a friend of mine who basically said hey you're nerdy too want to play dungeons and dragons and told me about it and i was like oh what's that da, da, da. Like, hey and they were like hey if you want to you know get into it and have a good look about what's going on look at critical role look at look at these third party things and and that's a good way of getting at least an example of of what you'll be playing and then they obviously did the whole speech of don't expect our campaign to be to that level and but you know that's and then we played uh yeah i was a homebrew thing it was nothing that had been written by Wizards of the Coast, so it's so a lot of my my introduction barely had anything to do with Wizards of the Coast, other than looking up the basic rules. Uh, my first experience with D and D was from like other people. I heard their like experiences playing the game, and then a few years later, I walked into a, a game store and found out that D and D was like a tabletop kind of thing. And from then on, I started to do, like research things. I tried to play with my friends, but they weren't really that interested. And I kind of forgot about it for a few years. And then, just like Crafty, Jason just like <laughs> started to do a campaign. And that's the first game I took part in. So, that's my story. <laughs> I've known uh, Jason for my entire life. He and I have been friends since I was a, literally a baby. And he and I, I think, heard about D&D &D from the same place, which was a TV show. But when it comes to actually playing it, I I never thought about it until Jason uh, and Crafty asked me to join one. So, um, Did anyone actually know that it was, like, it's a Hasbro property? Because I definitely didn't. No, until uh, all this had sort of happened, I the only thing I think I knew about Hasbro is that they uh, they made toys. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that's where my brain went when I first heard. Uh, the first time I heard that D and D was like under Wizards of the Ghost was uh, it it was actually a pretty big like news thing in my friend circle that Wizards of the Ghost bought the rights to D&D and that's how I found out but I didn't really think anything of it and look at look at us now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah but like the point I was making was like um like Wizards of the, the Coast and Hasbro have, have set out all this stuff and then like Chad said like um you know they should make money from the third party creators but in more cases than not it's the third party creators that have actually made them arguably most of their money anyway from introducing people to the game 
so they have made money from third party creators so it, it it's like it's like biting the hand that feeds them at the moment is kind of how i look at it i understand the, the point that was made about just people like quick Girl making millions all the time off of this but to be fair they're bringing out new content every week if not more than that and it's like they're doing like it's not like they're sitting there and getting rich off reading a book that wizards of the coast created so that's i think that's 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 i think that's the thing i understand and wizards of the coast like you said get an inf will probably get an influx of money from the original joining but it's wizards of the coast's fault that they're not producing content every week right why should other companies need to make up the slack yeah well, the way I see it, if, you know, they're mad that other people are making money that they're not based off it, well, then do better. Yeah, at the end of the day. <laughs> so you, you can't be mad because, you know, there's a yeah. third party. They've got, they've got more imagination than you have. They've got the more interest. You know, money talks. Uh, people are going to go to where the entertainment is. So D&D, &D, you know, if you want, you want to be mad at anyone, be mad at yourselves because... You you clearly you're not bringing in the talent. All this talent is out there. They're they're coming up with these great ideas, and stuff based on something that you've allowed them to do. And now what? Now you're angry because what they're bringing in more money than you? It's just like well, tough tough shit. You shouldn't have brought the OGL out in the first place, then, should you? You know, yeah. you don't like. You know, the only reason why it is yeah. as big as it is is because of people like the third, because of third party content creators. It's the only reason why you are as big as you are. Okay, so the uh, other thing that Chad Stick uh, uh, wanted to bring up was how how much is this going to affect um, the the player, as it were? You know, just not not the third party content creators, and not necessarily the DMs, because you know we know how it would affect them. They're the ones obviously buying the books normally, um, but just the the average player, how is this going to affect them uh, long term? It's it's that knock on chain effect, isn't it? It's it's it will not affect us directly. It just won't because it's the money they're asking for. Or we're not going to be paying anything. But what it's going to affect is all the little companies that produce the content that we want. Um, and if it affects them in too much of a negative way, maybe they stop producing content. Maybe they stop producing as much content. Maybe they produce content for a different game where they don't have to give up half like half their money all the time. Well, our exaggeration, where they don't have to give up any of their money all the time. In which case, us as D&D players will then start feeling the effects. Lack of content, lack of response. And that's when it starts becoming an issue for us. And then we start moving to other games where we get to use these third-party books and then D&D gets screwed out of money anyway. So it's that's, that's how I see it. It's, it will not affect us directly, but it's the knock-on consequences that is, gonna, that is what's down the line going to have an impact on us. I I think it I think it will come down to there will, there won't be any change massively. I don't think in the landscape for a good couple of years. Obviously, depending on this next OGL they put out, but it will come down to the likes of Critical Role and. Um, Right, I know it's a small one, but Vigla Dirty D and D and oh, what's some of the other, some of the other big streaming channels? The big Twitch Dimension Twenty, yeah, Dimension Twenty. That's what I'm thinking of. Just um, if those guys switch, because that's where I think a lot of publicity comes from. If those guys start to move on and go, actually, we're going to start playing Pathfinder, something else. I think then you'll see a big shift. But if those guys go, actually. You know, it, the new OGL is not that bad. We can deal with this. Or if it really does just get scrapped and they stick with the original and they go, right, but you're sticking to it this time and they actually go along with it. And all of that landscape stays the same. I can't really see it changing much at all because they're the ones that drive the change. Uh -huh. uh, I guess then we can only just sort of wait and see uh, how things are going to play out over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I mean, who knows, even by the time this comes up, we might even have uh, more announcements uh, come out. Um, so we're, we are going to move on. But just before we do, um, Chad Stick, I know obviously you couldn't have been here, mate, but very much appreciate you giving your input, even though, you know, we might not agree completely on everything that you came across. You do have, you always have valid uh, input, so it's always appreciated. But uh, we look forward to the next time you, you come down. Um, so 
on to the next thing. Uh, from one headache to another, we're going to go on to metagaming. If it, it, is it so bad? And if so, you know, why is it bad? Or is there good examples uh, of, of when metagaming can be used effectively? But before uh, we go much further than that, I am, of, of course, uh, going to refer to you to the rules lawyer, Pete. Pete, if you could take it away, please, and let us know what is metagaming. Every time. All right. Uh, from my understanding, once again, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, metagaming is using your knowledge that you as a player have from outside of the game and bringing it inside of the game in order to sort of affect the outcome or give your character knowledge that they might not actually have. Um, an example of which would be if there's, I think it's trolls off the top of my head, have an ability which they, they take, if they don't take fire or acid damage in a turn, they regain hit points. So if it's it's like, oh, your character's seen a troll for the first time, and one of the players went, yeah, everybody, fire and acid damage, that's the way to go, they won't heal, where, where their character might not actually know that. So that's, that's metagaming, it's bringing knowledge from outside of the game into the game. All right there, thank you very much, Rules Lawyer P. I can always count on you, but uh, shed some light on any matter that it's, uh, we're a bit in the dark about. So yeah, metagaming. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't like it. I don't like really anything that kind of draws people out of a game. Um, I think the, the whole idea that you're bringing outside knowledge into uh, into the game, uh, kind of ruining the moment, sort of ruins the fun. It's it's not something I'm a big fan of. Uh, what about uh, what about you, Rumpel? Yes. Um... I think uh, build it. I I agree with you. I I don't like meta gaming. I've I like it. You know, yeah. Separate yourself from your character. Your character doesn't know something, and you do. <laughs> Pretend like you don't, kind of thing. You know, um, if your if your player is a barbarian, he's not going to have knowledge of arcane spells, even if you, the player, might just random. But the one thing where I think it gets the line gets blurred if you, you take the troll thing for instance and you're a level three wizard fighting a troll and you use fireball as your standard cantrip and the first thing you do is throw out a fireball if you yourself know that know the troll's not gonna heal your character doesn't but your character's go-to is a fireball is that still metagaming and i think the lines can get a bit blurry sometimes at times like that because some people argue yes some people argue no i um i i think this is yeah it's quite an awkward kind of like thing because i obviously as a resident rules like have been in situations before where it's been like oh yeah i know what this creature's weakness is but my character doesn't how do i in my head decide you know when would that happen when when I almost feel myself like, am I metagaming if I use the spell now? I'm not using it first, but how many turns in would it make sense for me to use it? Because as as my class, I mix up a lot of my spells. I don't have my go-tos that I only use. So I usually mix up quite a lot. So at what point does it become metagaming for me to do this thing? And I think that's quite like a, a thing. So usually I try to, to let other members of the party take the lead uh, on it. And another thing that I, I find is quite useful is Mess like it's much easier online is message your dm say hey i as the player know this is there any chance that my character would and then you're, you're like maybe my my grandfather maybe my uncle someone told me the story cool and then your dm might be like all right make a check history check medicine check something and cool you roll low you don't know you roll high maybe you do and then that's 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 if that's a way of, if you're not certain you can anti-meta game of, met of trying to keep yourself in a nice little safe zone there is what I would recommend. Hmm. So, since I'm, like, kind of new to D&D, I don't know much. So, I can't, like, uh, <laughs> know about the moves and, like, hit points, weaknesses and stuff about certain monsters, for example. But from my, my perspective, it's essentially, like, breaking the fourth wall. You lose the dis tension that comes from, like, the unknown. Imagine never being lost on what to do. Like, I have felt, like, the helplessness 
in a bunch of situations where I don't know what to do, so that makes me, like, put more thought into what my character would do in that situation. So, in, in that example, I would, like, play as the character I made instead of playing, like, rationally. And when I do know stuff like the weaknesses and so on, I would, like, ask to make a roll on it if my character, like, knows anything or can find out anything. That's, like, the way I would do it, at least. I am a fan of metagaming there. I said it. <laughs> I have come out. <laughs> I am a fan. <laughs> I, I think if you think of it in this light, you might agree with me. Uh, everything is metagaming, basically. Like, anything that you would know from a previous campaign that you're on that your character might not know is technically metagaming. I mean, your character, you can only fill in so many sheets and so many ideas what they would know. Like, how do you know your character knows how, if the sun is the center of the universe? Do they know that? Do they, do they know astrology? Like, how much should, astronomy? Do they know physics? Do they know, like, do they understand? They have a good eyesight, bad eyesight. Like all this stuff is like you're just assuming. So metagaming sounds like to me like a terrible metagaming. Of course, I'm against like metagaming where you're like it completely ruins the plot. That's different. But I'm talking about metagaming where it's just you. You probably should know this, and just ask your DM if you're in any way confused. But in my opinion, like whatever you could take from previous uh, campaigns, you should. It's okay. Like it, we shouldn't. We don't have to take it way too seriously. Okay. All right. All right. I don't. Um, mm. It's interesting. Um, I wouldn't have gone down the road of like, obviously things like the the sun and stuff. I wouldn't really count those sort of things. I try. I try to think of where an example would be though, where like metagaming would be acceptable in it. Because I actually have some. Hmm. So it's it's almost like metagaming because it's a game, um, but it's it's like um, I, as a good old cleric main, know that healing is a big old metagame, like one hundred percent. If I'm like I will pick someone to heal based on how many hit points they have, or, or it's that that big difference between do I use healing word. Or am I using Revivify? Which point are they at? And then it's it's also like death saves specifically are something that I take a lot into account, which is like cool. Um, you know, I've got cool. That person's on two death saves, but that person's on two failed death saves, and that person's on two successes. Cool. I'm gonna go deal with the person who's on two failures because they're at most risk. That's meta gaming, unless your DM is like godlike levels and is able to intimately describe what they look like in a fashion that I could recognize as having failed death saves like I don't know they've split up they split up they spit up more blood or or you know oh the pain or whatever like then that that that's metagaming healing or choosing who to heal or that kind of thing wouldn't, is metagaming wouldn't that be just classed as playing the game not yeah. metagaming like obviously they like but that's that's, that's, what, that's what I mean. It's, 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 it's the, the thin line of it is playing the game, but well, it's I using knowledge of, of, of numbers and hit points and things like that, which aren't something your character would know, which could be classed as metagaming. No, but like I, I think I think more when you think metagaming is more like you as a player know this NPC is a s secret assassin trying to kill the king. Your player doesn't know this. You can't walk into the throne room and just declare they're an assassin because yeah. it makes no sense. Like I think that's like that's metagaming in a nutshell. Very much like the the hero. I I see where you're coming from, and it is a good point. But I always think that's just that's just the game but because it's, it is I, still it's still a real life game. You're not. That's I see what, what I mean. mean. I think it's 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 extreme versus small examples of metagaming. I'd say the healing things like that is metagaming. But it's very minor situations because it is knowledge from outside the game that is needed in order to make the game easier to play. Because if I'm playing a cleric and I'm using a healing word on a corpse, I'm wasting a turn, wasting a spell slot, not a good time. So you take the extra knowledge that you know to make the game fun. And that's, that's what I think it is. It's, it's 
maybe that's the line where metagaming is okay. Does metagaming make the game more fun for people or stop it being as enjoyable for people? I think, um, Crafty, did you have something, you had something about a puzzle? There was like a puzzle that you did once and it was uh, different because somebody yeah. knew the result and somebody didn't. I, I was yes. going to bring that up because that was you, Pete, and that was one of the funniest moments I can remember. <laughs> was it? No, 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 no. I'm sure it was you. Crafty. No, 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 I, no, I, no. I was there the second time the puzzle was done, and I think Crafty told me about it afterwards, and I was like, oh. No, no, no. Um, so, just just before I get to that, there is actually, it is quite interesting you bring up about, like, with the death saves and stuff. So, I, I would say, yes, that that is on a level that is a version of metagaming. But I guess if you were to break metagaming down into maybe, like, tiers... Mm -hmm. That would I would probably count that in the low end tiers, because yeah. it, it's definitely different difference between like what you were saying there and what Rumpel was saying, like and that sort of falls on what Schnitzel was saying about like the plot, like you know this character is actually uh, the assassin, therefore by you announcing that you 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 ruin the plot, and your character there's no way your character would know that that's like that's advanced tier sort of metagaming, whereas yeah. the um, Knowing the knowing what someone's um, death saves are, although it would, that is something that I am guilty of. Uh, everyone here who's been in the game, we're all guilty of it because we've all aware because everyone's telling each other like, oh, I've I just got a I just got a natural one on the death save, and everyone's like, oh, and everyone <laughs> everyone knows that person desperately needs to be saved. But it's like your characters, your character has no idea. Like you're lying on the ground. There's no difference between looking at that and a dead body right now. Unless Especially like, when it's that paladin in full plate mail, or yeah. just like full unless, full body armor. Unless you, as a DM, use that as a, as a way of describing and say like, "Oh, you could see that their you could see their chest is moving up and down, but it's dramatically slowed down." Um, but I guess one of the ways you go, I guess, to go around that is you'd say death saves are to DM only. So no one can know, and you're not allowed to announce what they are. The DM can react and decide, you know, to put that across. But because again, it could ultimately change the tactics of what the party is doing. If they know they've got someone who just desperately needs to be saved, but they were going to go and heal someone else, well, now they're not going to go and heal that person. They're going to go back to the other one. So yeah, it can, well, I, I have older. seen I've seen homebrew rules where um, DMs just roll death saves behind the screen. They don't even tell you. Your own death saves. Yeah. And so it's like that, but yeah, like that, just ramped up. So no one knows other than the DM, and you've got to make that decision. So as soon as someone goes down, it's do you leave it? Do you chance it? Like, what do you do? That would stress me out. I would as, as the as the that would stress me out beyond belief. Okay, Everyone's so life would be in my hands every time they went <laughs> down. So the uh, the 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 thing that Pete mentioned there about the um, the the puzzles. So we in my campaign. I do, it's basically, it's effectively, it's the same campaign. I do one for all my friends uh, in the UK and, and Sarone. And the other one I do for my American friends, including Schnitzel. And Let's go! It's, there, are, there are differences, because I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be word for word the exact same. So the plot for their story has actually taken a different direction to what happened to you guys. But I won't say more than that, because I don't want to spoil it. But they have cut, they came across the island uh, which had the puzzles underground, mm -hmm. and one of the rooms that we had was is this chamber. The doors had locked themselves, and there's like a pedestal in the middle with a button on it. And above the door, the one that they need to go through, there's a spiraling uh, set of numbers going one to twenty. When someone pushes the button, the room's uh, supposed to be quite well lit at the time, and when they push the button, the lights go out and the numbers light up and then the numbers start counting down and me as the dm just speaks the numbers out they go 20 19 18 as it starts building tension and when it gets to like 15 like the numbers change color and you start hearing a rumbling in the walls and the numbers keep going down and it, it, you just keep increasing the tension as it as it goes along now the first group the uk group there was someone in the group uh, he's he's no longer in the campaign. His schedule had changed so much that he wasn't going to be around. But he knew this puzzle as he was a DM himself and he had actually used this room multiple occasions. But because he knew it, he pretended he didn't. His character had no idea what it was, so he just played along with it. 
and the party hit the button on numerous occasions and reset it and it kept going back down and then they had no idea what to do and now the trick was with this puzzle is that you did nothing it it, it, it was a nothing it was a mind game at the end of it because once it gets to one lights all come back on door opens it's all fine it's just a bit of fun a bit of time wasting you know a bit of tension building when we played with the second group now i had forgotten i had told one of the players months before about this room because i really loved the puzzle and i was like i was so pleased i got to use it and i thought i'll tell jason all about this when we go to play he remembered but instead of going along with it because his character wouldn't know he was just like i think we should just leave the button alone and at that point i'm sitting there like crap he remembered and he's just let and they didn't even I, I, so did you guys even press the button once or did you just leave it no, I definitely, I was the one who was demanding we press the button, so we pressed at least once, maybe twice, but then after that, we kind of just listened to him and was like, alright, maybe know some, we don't. Yeah, so the, the whole room lasted for like a minute or so, and like, it was a bit disappointing because I could just remember like how everyone was in the first group. Like, people were freaking out about, you know. Shocked. That was, <laughs> was some so of the so most fun I've I, ever had. I had in my head, I was like laugh. terrified, and like the only reason I I didn't press it again is because in my head I was like I hope to dear God that Crafty isn't the type of DM to just kill us all in one stroke. I, but, that's the only reason in my head I was like it's meta gaming in itself. Or I was there like we've been there for a good few minutes. I like, couldn't think of anything else. So I was like fuck it, let's just re hope Crafty's not that kind of DM. And I'm, even my character was like bracing, casting every spell he could think of, just like let's let's get us through this. I think it, I think shit. that was like my third ever session of D and D yeah, as well. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember trying to pass through the door and trying to press the button. <laughs> it was it was so much fun. Like I just this is the fact. I think it's because I was doing the counting in real time, so it wasn't giving anyone the chance to sit and think about it. It was just they had to react, react, react. And it is the number would get down. I think at one point it got down to like three, and someone was just like, "I hit the button." <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure someone was like, someone did eventually. It wasn't even the one who knew about it. It was someone else who said, "Should we just let it run to the to the end?" And like, it's really, 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 you know, we all put yeah. to the walls, and we were like, "If we just stand by the walls and just see what happens, <laughs> like <laughs> shields and shit." I had like my arms <laughs> and my shield wrapped around somebody. I can't remember who it was, but it was just like. Oh, I think it was God. around me because I was the squishy wizard with like eight points. It was around point you. I was like, I'm, I'll protect the wizard. I'll do what I can. See if I can absorb some of the flow. And it was, and then nothing happened. I was like, crap. And the stuff. thing is, you could, you could see it in your mind's eye. These characters, like you got this hulking great big Goliath, just sort of panically looking left and right, holding his long sword. <laughs> Like you got the you got the the Janassi like hugging the wizard. It's just like <laughs> I'll protect you. <laughs> it was just... fact, you you had almost died like the session before from the wild magic sorcerer just <laughs> killing you by being nearby. <laughs> you were in a fragile place. I was like, must protect Squishy Boy. <laughs> it was it was it was such a great moment, and I wanted to reenact that. And it was it was such a shame. As I said, I don't begrudge Jason. You know, okay, fair enough. He, he's done it, but that's a perfect example. Where someone's meta game now, maybe he he wasn't intending to to sort of ruin the moment, but I think if he had just maybe thought about it just for a second more, he might have then thought, you know what, it would be better just to play out, just see how the other two like cope with it, because who knows? And he could have even made it a bit more fun. He could have let it run all the way down to one, and he's like, I push the button, just to, just <laughs> to build the suspension up a little bit more, you know. No, like it's a bit of a shame, but that there is definitely an example of uh, of uh, meta gaming. There's a uh, did any of you other guys, uh, did any of you got any examples where someone has done some meta gaming and it ha and it has for you it, it, you, it felt like it, it's ruined the moment? Okay, I guess not. All right. <laughs> I feel like I have. I feel like yeah. I feel like I have, but I can't remember. Specific. You know, when you're like someone asks you what your favorite book is, and suddenly you forget the name of every book you've ever read. <laughs> it's that. I feel like I feel like yeah, there's something. Just so like, I... what's a book? What? <laughs> what? Paper? What? <laughs> or, or everyone's agreeing with me, and and they actually do like meta gaming. They just didn't know. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> secretly love it. I too have it. <laughs> I saw this. this is the okay. center of the universe. No, because if, <laughs> if you meta gamed in that moment in that trap, it would have taken away a very fun memory I now have. <laughs> 
Uh, well, here's my thing, is that I just don't know enough about um, D&D to metagame well. If I knew a lot more about D&D than I do, then I could probably, you know, cheat my way and learn some stuff, you know, and, and, and do what we're talking about. But because I'm someone who really can't metagame, it's so helpful when other people are like, oh, I actually know what to do here. And it's like, yes, thank you. Because I was n so confused, um, and I was going to get screwed, and oh, wait, wait, I actually know this. And it, it helps out. But I, I just think that metagaming, were, it's just so hard to, to pinpoint what exactly is metagaming, right? Because how, how do you know exactly what is metagaming? Because even knowing that your character, certain things that you have to know about your character but didn't write down in your description, is that metagaming or is that just you just omitted it from your character? Like, you could see the character has, because of, let's say, the picture they put on, well, the character is has a scar, let's just say that. Well, they never said that a scar, just that part my person noticed that, do they have good eyes, do they have bad eyes? Like, it's, this, it's you have to metagame a little bit in these games, because you can't I, get every detail right. I don't think I would class that as metagaming. I think me metagaming no. is bringing outside knowledge inside the game to, like, become better almost, to know knowledge that you shouldn't do. It's not like... Oh, I, I remembered something about my character that doesn't actually have an... It's when it has an impact. That's what I would say. It's bringing knowledge from outside the game that has an actual impact on what is happening within the game. Um, and I, I, I get what you're saying about... But I also think maybe metagaming is okay as long as it doesn't stop people having the enjoyment that they would. Because like, maybe you're all right with the whole, like, you don't know when you're stressed because you don't know what's going on and, and it's not in a fun way, maybe having someone metagame and step forward a little bit and be like, oh, well, actually, maybe this is the way to fix it. Maybe that's okay because it well, can always release yeah. the stress. But if it's, maybe yeah. if it's uh, I'm taking the fun away, then I'd say maybe that's a problem. Well, let me like, let me just put it like this to kind of explain what I think. I mean, it would be a little more concise. Yeah. Controlled metagaming is better than knowing something even though that you shouldn't actually say it, but keeping it to yourself when other people who are much newer D and D are struggling and are like, man, I really wish I knew, you know, this from an, from knowing D and D. That way, I wouldn't be like, oh, you could have just done this. And it's like, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know I could do that. So, uh, does that so make I think, sense? I think in situations like that, so you're talking more more about like the core mechanics of the game or the of the plot? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not as, like if you like. Uh, the plot, that's different. I, don't, I agree with you, like, Jason, Tyler, but he should have just said, Hey, DM, I actually know what to do here. Should I say something, or should I just keep my mouth shut? And you would have said, well, let's not, let's not ruin it for other people. I agree with that, but what I'm talking about is, like, not that specific metagaming. I'm talking about metagaming where it's not the plot, but things you should not know, like, Oh, an orc can do this, even though my character has never said that he knows how to do that. Does okay, so yeah, so I think I think in scenarios like that, I think and I think this is going to be the takeaway for this sort of thing is it is going to be a case of you you ask the DM um, if it's something that you you think that maybe you should know something about a certain scenario, then you would say uh, maybe send a message to the DM and say, by the way, this orc that's that's involved, would my character know anything specific? Well, you wouldn't even have to private message to DM. This would be an opportunity for you as the player just to turn around and say a uh, question for the DM. Would my character know anything about this orc? And then the DM might turn around and go, actually, because they would have access to your character sheet and go, given your background history and stuff, you actually would have had experiences with, with orcs. So you would know X, Y, and Z. It's kind of like what we're doing with, um, where we've got the, the, the non PC NPC, uh, character player that is in our the, the campaign i do with you uh, uh where he's playing that spirit he can't really act, react too much to things but now and then he may have insight information so he would ask me and i'd let him know what information he would have what he would be privy to so it, it's something similar to that sort of thing i mean a lot of the a lot of the times when it comes to that kind of information it's just a simple case of you ask your dm if they also if, yeah go on I was just gonna say that's the perfect time, isn't that the whole point for like checks? 
history checks, nature checks, medicine checks. I was gonna, if, that, that was going to be my next bit. Is, is that it could yeah. be a case either the DM straight up just says yes, you know this because of your characters X, Y, Z, or they might turn around and go, "Well, your character might know this, but I want a history check." And therefore, then if your roll is good, they might turn around and go, "Right, your character knows this, that, and the other." If you roll like a free, you'd be like, um, "You know that's an orc. That's all you know. Mm. You know nothing else. You've just heard of orcs. You've seen a picture of them once." You know nothing else about them, and then you play off of what that what that information that you've been given. I think I, I had something similar like that in um in a friend's campaign where my character went to university and studied things. So every now and then I'll say, "Hey, is this something I would have studied?" I, I told them my area of study, and I say, "Is this slightly relevant to what I might have learned?" History check, cool. See if I was paying attention in that class. Well, bloat, no, I was not cut in class again mm. damn it but it's, it's, it's one of those things like there's there's always a way to sort of bring in metagaming in a health and safety safe way that doesn't kind of like prevent anyone else having fun yeah yeah you know i agree with you as again a lot of it can be situational but i think we've definitely i think at the very least we've managed to distinguish between what would what would be considered like a low end tier form of meta gaming, and what would be sort of more like on the extreme uh, version of it? Yeah. Don't ruin the plot. It's okay to heal if someone's about to die. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like. <laughs> I, I understand that the whole plot thing. To be fair, because there are so many times when I'm writing something and I'm like, oh, I want to tell people. <laughs> I want to tell people about this cool thing that I thought of, and I'm like, I need to make sure it's someone who's not part of the campaign. Because if you tell someone in the campaign that, first, it ruins the campaign for them, and you can't, you know, hold them accountable if they're then like, well, actually, the DM told me a week ago that that guy is actually, like, just like someone said earlier, the assassin or something like that. Oops. Don't tell your players <laughs> something you don't want their characters to know. Yes. Uh,. All right, uh, I think we've I think we've covered meta gaming quite well, there, guys. Uh, yeah, so yeah. we are going to wrap up this topic, and uh, we're going to go to a new segment. Uh, this uh, we call mastering the dungeon, and this is where I've set up a, uh, a, a short amount of questions. Uh, or I believe one of them is going to have multiple choice. Uh, some of them are going to have more than one answer. Uh, it's going to be a point for each answer that you get. Uh, now, I have got us uh, an app. Uh, it's called Buzzin. Uh, it's a free app. Anyone wants to use it. Buzzin.live. Uh, you can have up to eight people uh, play in there, not including the one who's hosting. And that's going to be completely free. If you want to do more, I believe you've got to pay for it. But we're going to use this. Uh, first one to buzz in gets to answer. You can wait until I've answered the question. But if you think you already know the answer, you go straight ahead and you hit that buzzer. I will take your first answer. And if it is wrong, you will not be able to buzz back in until someone until that question has been resolved. If you're correct, you will get a point, and we'll move on to the next one. By the end of it, uh, whoever has the most amount of points is going to be crowned uh, Master of the Dungeon. Now, just a short disclosure. Uh, one of these questions, because I've done a trial run before, and I did it with Pete and Schnitzel. One of these questions I asked you about a week ago. I've double-checked this since, and turns out that answer was incorrect. So it's it could catch you guys out. Now, are you doing the, are you doing the same questions? Not the same question. Not all <laughs> of them. Those same questions. There's, there's one or two in there, but again, I've taken out things like multiple okay, okay. options. Yeah, some yeah. of some of them actually had more than one right answer, and so okay, like that. interesting. So it's it's going to be it's going to be quite an interesting one here, guys. Um, so I'm going to unlock the buzzer. Please do not buzz straight away because it is going to pick up the sound. I have no idea how tempting it was to buzz. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's very, very... Don't do this. Do the thing. Do the thing. What? All it's right. a giant green button. <laughs> it's green. If we're all ready. There are going to be uh, 12 questions with a possibility of 15 points up for grabs. Okay. So, question number one. And I will accept the answer... Uh, whoever is the closest to this one, if it is not absolutely accurate. What year was the game Dungeons & Dragons first introduced? Go 
Schnitzel. 1969? That unfortunately is not the correct answer. Sorry, I just really wanted to say 69. <laughs> uh, Sarone was next. Uh, <laughs> 1987? Uh, unfortunately, is the incor is an incorrect answer. Uh, so it's Sarone with that one, Schnitzel with that one. Uh, Rumpel, you are next. Uh, 1981. Uh, unfortunately, that is incorrect as well. So it's on you, Pete. 1968. Unfortunately, that is also incorrect. Ah. So, uh, the correct answer was the year that the game Dungeons & Dragons was first introduced was 1974. Oh! Uh, so I will take the one who got the closest, which would have been Schnitzel with 1969. So, one point to Schnitzel. 69 always wins! Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> it's true! <laughs> Why did you sound so stressed by the fact that it's true? <laughs> it's true, I tell you. Oh my god, he's right. <laughs> okay, I need to know. My brain, crafty. Is there going to be anything about the wild magic table in this? Because I want to look up what sixty nine is on the wild magic table. <laughs> there, there is nothing in this set of questions about the wild magic table. But no, cool. I'm, I'm that just... in for a future for a future quiz. Well, I'm, I'm looking up sixty nine now. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Each creature within 30 feet of you becomes invisible for the next minute. The invisibility ends on a creature when it attacks or casts a spell. Thank you, you very much. You do a much. lot when you're invisible for a minute. <laughs> Question number two. Who are the two creators of Dungeons & Dragons? Oh, I only know one. I don't know either, fuck. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> I know one, with, I think. We're going to go with Schnitzel. Um, I actually have no idea, but I know one of them is, like, Fronghanger, and I guess the other guy's name is Bob. I'm afraid neither of those are correct. Uh, the next one to buzz in was Rumpel. Is one of them Gary Gygax? One of them is Gary Gygax. Ah, that's the only one I know. I have no idea what one. <laughs> anyone guess who the second person was? I have no idea. <laughs> hey. Stanley. Unfortunately not. <laughs> that is that is Marvel. Uh, <laughs> the second person was Dave Arneson. Not close. Yeah, that. Oh my god, it's Dave. <laughs> it's always Dave. I, was, I said Bob, that was close. Oh, yeah. damn it, Dave. <laughs> Question number three. Which class uses rage? Peter, <laughs> Peter came in first. <laughs> Barbarian. That is correct. Question number know. four. Which group has their own Amazon D&D show called Vox Machina? It's not letting me buzz. Oh, yeah, crap. Yeah, yeah. I, could... All right, I, I could got it anyway. Yeah. I got it anyway. It's okay. Yeah, go on, Pete. Quick roll. Hey, that is correct. Let me apologize. Let me clear those buzzers again. That was my bad. <laughs> I was looking at like, why is it saying buzz buzzed already? <laughs> I was just tapping my spacebar like, come on. <laughs> it's already red. <laughs> Question, uh, you're all clear, don't worry, you're all good. Question number five. What does OGL stand for? Goes for Rumpel. Open gaming license. That is correct. Yeah. At the start of it, I was like, that's going to come up somewhere. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> Question number six. What is the name of the film starring Tom Hanks that was based on Dungeons and Dragons? Oh, you fucking did it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I remember hearing about this, but there's yes, no right. thing. We literally spoke about this a couple weeks ago. <laughs> we did, you did. I, I never, I know I've never seen this movie. Neither have I. It's a really bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, does that help your answers? <laughs> No, it is not. Does anyone want to take a step? No, I've got a Schnitzel? Bob in the basement? Bob in the basement. That, unfortunately, is not the correct answer. Uh, okay, if no one else is going to give it an attempt, the correct answer was Mazes and Monsters. Just really Aww. annoying. So, me and my friends were talking the other day, and now all I've got in my head is bed knobs and broomsticks. 
knobs and that's, it. that's all I could think of. And if that's not what the next D and D movie is named, I'm gonna be mad. <laughs> Good name for a D and D movie. I mean, yeah, it's already a movie, but you know, who cares? Okay, question number seven. Let's make sure that buzzer is clear. This is again. This is a two answer. What type of damage will disable troll regeneration? <laughs> I couldn't believe that this had even come up in a discussion earlier. I'm just okay. good. I'm that good. Go ahead, Pete. Acid and fire. Correct. Two points for I see you, Rumpel, trying to get in on that. <laughs> I, answered the que- I answered the question before the question even existed. I only, me- I only remembered fire. <laughs> <laughs> question number eight. What is the strongest type of giant? We'll go for Rumple. Storm Giant. That is correct. Yeah, you bastard. <laughs> just, I'm just going to tell you now, I would not have guessed that. I wouldn't. It's about, I wouldn't about of giant strength is like 20, 29 for a Storm Giant, I want to say. <laughs> I just I was looking at 29 or 27. But yeah, no, no. I, I remember being stronger, but that's one of the ways I can remember. Because it's like hell is the lowest. Yeah. Question number nine. All devils are immune to what forms of damage? Go for Rumpel. Fire. Fire, that is correct. You want to take a stab at what the other one is? Oh, there's another one. Uh, I'm, I'm, aren't they immune to um, magic? Any spell damage? Resistant, I know that. but they're not that immune. Is, that is not an answer. Uh, so I'm going to go now to Pete. Do you have, do you know what the second one is? The poison. It is poison. I like yeah. this. Took my fire, Rumpel. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so number ten. HP or hit points are determined by what? Go for Pete. Well, I, I, I assume you're asking what modifier is added when rolling for hit points, which is a constitution modifier, or it's whatever your class hit dice is, which will range between a d6 and a d12. You can't answer it with two different, level. Two different answers. <laughs> you have to pick one. That's not fair, bro. I'll go for the first, the first thing he came, with, came out with, which was constitution, which is correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just checking, he, you know, he could have meant, like, how is it determined throughout the game? <laughs> right. Or he there might are, have meant, how is it determined modify? There are only two questions left, both with one answer each. What's the scores on the doors? Scores Don't on the tell doors. us. Don't tell us till the end. All right, okay. Oh. I won't say anything. Question number 11. What do the letters D, M, step? <laughs> Dungeon Master. That is correct. <laughs> he knows this before you even see the DM. I, I said he could. I said he could. You got I to the D and it was either going to be D and D or DM. And it's, it was a 50 50 chance. That, was, yeah, that, was a good, that would have been brilliant. You should, have, you should have just let him go. If you'd <laughs> stopped, if you'd stopped it would be interesting to wonder what I went for. But I, <laughs> I could have gone even further and got D E X. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, true. <laughs> and final question number 12. How many different base abilities are there? Go for Pete. Six. Six is correct. And that brings us to the end of our first Mastering the Dungeon quiz. Now for the scores. In last place, we have Sarone with zero. Scoop! <laughs> I... In third I... place, we have Schnitzel with one. In second place is Rumpel with four. Oh. And our first master of the dungeon is our rules lawyer, Pete, <laughs> with an impressive eight points. I feel like I feel like I Jesus, had to. I just... <laughs> it was not as close as I thought. <laughs> Either had a great strategy, which is I'm just going to press the button as soon as he just starts the question, and then it is just hey, as soon as he's going to get the question. I did that 
one time. You did that at least three times. Don't no. you lie to me. <laughs> oh. 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 Save, save it, save it, lads, save it, lads, for the next for the next time we do this. You know, bring your A games, get hold of those player handbooks, because we know how desperate what uh, Wizards of the Coast are right now. <laughs> right. And with that, everybody, we are going to close it up for today. I'd like to thank uh, Schnitzel, Saro, and Peter, and Rumpel. If you guys want to say your goodbyes. Goodbye, world. It is 420. Blaze it. <laughs> Bye, the minute that it's going to date me, someone please save me. <laughs> See you once again. If you've got any weird, weird facts or weird gaming things, you'll let me know. I'm always good to learn, and if I got anything wrong, please also let me know. Um, goodbye. If I'm not back next week, I'm trying to save the road. <laughs> And uh, okay. goodbye uh, from me as well. Thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed this content, please make sure to hit the like button. Maybe even smash that subscribe button. At the time of this recording, we're currently at 39 subscribers. We're just one away from 40. It's been teetering on that for like two weeks. Like, come on, just get me push it over that little barrier just a little bit more. But if not, never mind. Thank you very much for listening. Join us next time when we will be uh, talking about the new Dungeons and Dragons movie that's due to release, I believe, in March, unless they want to pull a fast one and delay it for whatever reason. Uh, and we'll also be going over min maxing. How bad is it? And is it appropriate? All that and more next time on Roll for Discussion. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. <laughs>